Hey guys, I am uh, introducing a another artist today. It's called Phil Saunders. Welcome. So pretty much, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. But yeah, yeah. we uh, we were just talking before about um, well, my my honesty to uh, franchises and things like that. How I think there's so many of them. You're you 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 do a lot of work for franchises, and I really like your work. Nigga like if you took away like whatever the franchise was your work is still really really good and that's what i like about it like your design language that's something that's caught my eye so it's not um especially because you do you've done a lot of iron man uh like you did a lot of iron man revisions but what's all that about like is that they just ask you for heaps and heaps of concepts and you just go to town or well i mean every movie has um some you know different story requirements i mean my my uh my design approach is is really story driven um mm. you know i love storytelling i love movies and for me design is just one more aspect of storytelling so the job is to find a way to help tell the story through the visuals i mean mm. movies uh are a very interesting and different art form uh you know unlike novels where you can go off on a tangent and and describe the world and describe the the history behind the scenery and whatever else uh for for 20 pages um with a movie it's what you see is what you get you you start the movie and you're on a moving train of storytelling and there's no time to um to pause and you know describe in detail the world mm -hmm. uh that you're inhabiting and so you know it's it's up to the designers to tell that story visually uh and use uh the design within a movie to um you know back up and reinforce uh whatever emotional story that you're trying to tell in the movie so, you know, with, with Iron Man suits in particular, um, you know, their job is to not only fulfill the plot requirements um, of that particular film, but also to reflect the state of mind of um, Tony Stark in any given movie. So there's mm -hmm. always, there's so, always something involved in how we're designing it uh, to try to reinforce you know that character story that they're trying to tell yeah so that's, that's kind of where it comes from so every every time we go back in and, and design the suit and redesign the suit uh you know first we're looking at uh okay well what, what does it have to do what what's the new tech what's the new um powers that it has as spelled out in the script mm -hmm. uh, or what potential for that because sometimes we're on very very early where we don't even have a script yet we just have you know beach beat or an outline or or the director telling us the ideas that he wants to to pursue in the particular version of the movie. Uh, so we're you know we're looking at that first. We're looking at where we came from and what the next logical. Mm. Yeah.
Yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah. No, it's it's it's. I see a lot of uh, you've, a lot of people don't get your tying story into the design, which is great because then it reflects your, your design. The designs work better, and sometimes people don't always consider doing that, and like you can really see it in your work and. That you, you have, I really like your polish. Some of your two D stuff is really, like, is it? It's almost like you've uh, airbrushed. It looks like airbrushing in some of it. Like that's that seems to be like a, it's kind of like a lost um, craft of, like I'm just looking at some of them now, and it's like they look really refined, like really refined and airbrushed. It, is that something that you pride yourself on doing and getting, getting right type of thing? Yeah. You know, when you when you start getting, you know, for, for product design or automotive design, really, where where it's really just about the subject. Mm. Um, and the transition to, uh, you know, feature film, con feature film concept design, which is more illustrative and has to con convey more emotion and more mood and more atmosphere, um, you know, has been sort of a lifelong struggle and transition for me because that, mm. you know, requ requires a, a much more holistic and, and loose approach that generally you would get from a fine arts background or or an illustration background um and uh you know i mean i started back when it was again marker and gouache and, and uh, those kinds of tools um and then you know transitioned into photoshop illustration uh when i was in video games um and then you know started in 3d and 3d is still more of a secondary tool for me i, I still tend to to lean more on my uh 2d skills than than 3d 3d yeah. is more of a problem solving tool for me okay um and uh you know i i you know i've i've been using 3d since the early 90s i mean i was initially trained on alias studio back in in the car design days oh yes yeah. Yeah, I like back, back when it was on <laughs> big old silicon graphics uh, mainframes. Um, they were huge PCs. Were they big, like expensive, like super, super Oh, expensive. yeah, they, these uh, Indigo workstations yeah. that were you know, 100 grand or whatever. Oh, that, wow. you know, had to be, you know, Nissan had to buy them. You couldn't have one on your own. Jeez, um, that's expensive, yeah. But but the, uh, you know, the 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 sense of polish and detail and refinement has stuck with me. Uh, and I mean, I guess it's regardless of what I'm working on, it's, it's still a bit of my stock and trade. Um, mm. But my, my journey has been to try to maintain that while having a looser approach. Mm. Um, so, you know, I mean, I, I used to have a technique that was very technical with a lot of layers in Photoshop and allowed me to control things in a very 
deliberate way. Uh, and I've, I've spent the last decade sort of weaning myself off of that and, and going more to a, you know, as few layers as possible, as simple a brush as possible kind of mm. approach, um, you know, which I guess you can maybe see in my later work, which feels maybe a little bit more fluid and a little bit more painterly or. Yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, it's. Cause then. Um... It's a yeah. curse and a blessing at the same time, I guess. It's it's like a it's something that you fight with yourself type of thing. You're fighting that. It's like a you would you say it's like a habit that you you want to loosen up. Is this what you're trying to say? That um, so some of the because they I'm looking at some of the Iron Man and the the ship stuff. Like they look they have that airbrush illustration feel, especially the yeah. Iron Man. Um, armor renders they have that like really crisp uh rendering type of uh work i think uh, you had one there's one for the avengers iron man i think mark 7 design mk7 design like those are they have a really sharp illustration like they almost look like that old school airbrushing yeah and that's yeah. that's kind of what that that older technique that I used to use um, was like, I mean, I would, uh, I would use a lot of alpha masking. Um, okay. So I would, uh, you know, I'd come up with a technique for, for doing that where um, I'd sort of have my primary surfaces on one layer and uh, you know, the, the silhouette would be defined in an alpha mask. Uh, sorry, in the, in the alpha channel. Yeah. Uh, and then I would effectively loosely airbrush um, the uh, the values inside of it. And then for any, you know, secondary surface or chamfer within that um, or, or any surface that, that was a, a surface transition, I would do that on a separate layer. And mm -hmm. again, loosely with a big brush, getting the the tonal shifts and stuff uh and then and then having the transition defined by my alpha channel yeah. uh and it allowed me to uh you know control the surfaces and control the transitions in a very very precise yeah. way but it was it was very stifling creatively oh yeah for, um and and now i just i guess i've got a little bit more control mm. uh and and more importantly a little bit more confidence i i find that in my career, a lot of these techniques that I had come up with to maintain control and flexibility were, were just a lack of confidence. Oh, really? Um, yeah. It I looks mean, so good. You know, but, I mean, the technique looks like, I mean, it, it, to me, it sounds like a technique. It looks good. Like it looks really refined. You know, it looks like, what's an example of something that, that is looser would, um, so like I'm looking at so the well, drone concept. I mean, if you're just comparing Iron Man suits, if you look yeah. at um, you know the Mark Forty Five mm. from uh, Avengers: Age of Ultron, or um, you know the the initial sketches for you know anything from Infinity War or Endgame, uh, you know not the not the 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 ZBrush stuff, but you know I always start and sketch and then when i get it to a certain point and i present that and they approve it mm. that's when i'll you know go to you know sculpting it in zbrush and rendering it out because back in the day we used to have to you know draw up elevations and orthographics and stuff and trying mm. to take a you know organic compound surface thing and try to get front view back view and side view that actually matched for uh yeah. you know for legacy to build something off of was mm. a nightmare and just yeah. took forever. It was painful so i finally buckled down and taught myself how to sculpt it in zbrush so i could just like i'm just gonna figure this out yeah, figure out yeah. how it works in the three-dimensional world <laughs> myself hand that off and then they can deal with it and i don't have to draw any elevations uh, i imagine it'd be painful because you have to get things precise in front side so you know like, yeah, well, yeah. you know back in those days you know i would do you know, and I learned how to do this in in uh, industrial yeah. design 
um, and you get as precise as you can, and then you hand it off to a 3D modeler, and then you're just constantly getting the, hey, now is this line supposed to line up with this line? I don't know if it quite, you know, you know it's like, oh, yeah. ah. <laughs> let me do you another little sketch. Yeah, I, I remember uh, doing similar. But yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, 3D, you know, having the artists themselves, I mean, obviously, you know, your, your work um, is initiated in 3D and, mm. and uh, you know, you've got a, a conceptual process that, that lives in the 3D world and that's amazing. Um, doing that translation from 2D to 3D has always been a challenge. Um, so, you know, Do have, having the artist be able to go through that process. And I mean, you know, back when I was a car designer, I was doing clay sculpting as well. And oh, so, cool. that's, you know, all of those, yeah. all of those techniques translate directly to something mm. like ZBrush. Yeah. Um, a little less so to Moto when I'm doing Moto because, um, I mean, that's a whole <laughs> side conversation yeah. about about the, the joys and pains of uh, 3D software. But the technical aspects that bog you, it kind of like they bog you down creatively. Like they, they stifle creativity at, at some point, I think. Well, yeah. yeah, I mean, I've, I've always felt like, you know, when I'm working in any 3D package and I've, you know, I've gone from Alias Studio to 3D Studio Max to Moto, now starting to play with Blender. Uh, you know, any one of those packages, I feel like 75% of my time is trying to wrestle with the software to make it do what I know it's supposed to do. Mm. And then 25% of it being creative. And I find it's exactly the opposite with ZBrush. With ZBrush, I'm spending 75% of my time being creative and 25% of my time trying to wrestle it into doing the thing, you know, yeah. making the shape that I know it can make. Yeah. Yeah, I get. I, I I understand you right right there. I I find because uh, a, a lot of people because you, know, you come from the car background. Do you remember working with NURB surfaces and having to do spline based mm -hmm. modeling and stuff like that? Yeah, and, yeah. and my brain still works that way because ah. <laughs> NURB's modeling uh, yeah. is probably the closest translation of how we would clay sculpt. Mm -hmm. um, an automotive model. I mean, you know, with, with automotive models, um, you know, we'd do our sketches and then we'd have an engineering package, you know, that would give us a plan view, a side view and a front view. And, you know, they'd be printed up on a big plotter. We would staple them to the wall and then take, uh, you know, graphics tape and, and draw our, our tape lines for for essentially the cross sections and then the clay sculptors would take uh those and they cut them out they glue them to plywood they bandsaw up that shape uh and then that would be the drag surface that they would uh pull through the clay to get you know your center line mm -hmm. of your car and they'd have yeah. one of those for every single cross section that they would uh you know define and then and then um you know, there would be certain character lines along the fender, along the hood, along the the uh, side of the car. And those character lines, they'd work really hard to bring the clay surface out to that character line. And then they'd put down, you know, a paper tape line to, to keep that protected. And then, um, you know, there'd be a paper tape line for the side fender line and then a paper tape line for the uh, for the hood fender line. And between those two lines, They'd take, you know, a curved piece of metal and they would generate that surface, that mm. that band surface, which is effectively what you were doing in Alias Studio, right? You'd, you'd have a character line here, a character line there that was a spline, and then you'd have a cross-section character line and that, that uh, you know, surface is swept mm. across. And it's just a collection of these surfaces. And then between the surfaces, you have transition surfaces. So my brain still thinks that way mm. when I'm, when I'm sculpting or when I'm, uh, you know, using sub D surfaces, I'm still trying to define, you know, where are those character lines that are going to control my reflections. Yeah, uh, even when I'm, even really when cool. I'm painting, mm. that's, that's, uh, 
you know, what I'm doing. Cause mm. I, I still think in terms of, you know, you, I have a very specific, I guess, form vocabulary uh, or, or way of breaking down form so that it's understandable to me and understandable how that controls reflections. Cause mm. you know, in my mind, hard surface uh, is, is not so much about designing the surface, it's designing how the surface will affect the light. Yes, yes. That, right? I've, I've, I've never had anyone say that to me before. I think that's because your background, right? Because you're, yeah, yeah this is you're really- definitely all, all stuff that I learned in automotive design because, mm. um, you know, one of the first lessons that I learned on the very first model that I made, um, you know, car that I was working on, translating my first sketches to a quarter scale model was what the, what the surface looks like when you draw it is not necessarily what the surface has to be to make it look like that thing that you drew. Mm. So, you know, you can have a reflection on the side of the car where, you know, that, that horizon line you think is, you know, in order to make it fall right about, you know, two thirds of the way up the door cross section or whatever, to get that to happen, we tend to have a, a natural assumption of what that cross section should be and how it should fall. Um, and, and the reality is that when you start working with it and start, you know, sculpting it in clay and then, you know, spraying a little water on a black plastic trash bag to stretch it over and put some Vaseline on it so that you get nice reflections, you realize, yeah. oh my gosh, you know, yeah. that section that I thought would make that thing that I drew actually is making it look a lot fatter and it's dropping the horizon line yeah. much further down. And in fact, rather than being this round section like this, it's actually more like, you know, a more sheer surface here and a more sheer surface here mm. with a very tight transition bone in between that's going to control from any angle where that horizon line reflection falls. So, yeah. I mean, it's, it's very, you know, surprisingly sophisticated stuff and, and mm. sometimes counterintuitive. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of what hard surface design has always been for me is, is how do I control the reflections? Mm. And, you know, and then there's the secondary element of it is how do I control those reflections in motion? Ah, it, in a strange yeah. way it's it's um it's not just three-dimensional graphic design because there is a graphic design element mm. of it in terms of controlling you know how those reflections fall and what shapes those reflections are going to make um you know particularly thinking in terms of you know highly reflective hard surfaces like cars mm. uh, but also you know, how are those reflections going to travel along the surface as the car is in motion? Yeah. yeah. Right? That, and, I never thought of that. Actually, never thought uh, of that. I mean, it, yeah. it's, <laughs> it's a really deep dive into minutia when you get no, to but I, I love all that stuff. I, I, that's, why, that's why I looked at your designs. I'm like, you've got, you have an understanding. That's what I thought. So that's, that's yeah. the, uh, you know, that's why it's so applicable to, you know, an Iron Man suit in particular, mm. as opposed to, um, you know, hard surface, matte finish, military mm. kind of stuff. Um, yeah. Because when you are watching Iron Man on screen, you want it to have that sense of precision that you would get from, you know, watching a beautiful video of, you know, street lights at night going across a Porsche fender or something mm. like that. Because there is a, there is a dynamic, uh, you know, a motion graphics dynamic to the, the precise way in which, you know, those reflections start slow and then accelerate across the fender. That's very satisfying. And you want to mm. get that same, that same sense of, of precision excitement um, in an Iron Man suit in a movie. So, mm. you know, there's, there's a degree of sophistication that that uh, we wanted to put into that that you don't necessarily or up until that point you didn't really get in. I mean, you know, by the time we did Iron Man, the closest thing to it was probably RoboCop in terms of a uh, yeah. 
wearable machine and and uh you know really nothing had, nothing had be, been done quite to that level of of precision i mean we were we were looking to create something that had a sense of you know aerospace level tolerances mm. on a human body you know uh um, yeah. you know with robocop for example the impression that you get is something that is um i mean it's you know one of the greatest designs in in uh you know feature film history yes um, it is yeah but, but the purpose of it was to create something that was mechanizing the human body and what we were having to do was to do something that was enhancing the human body in a sense of you know he's going to move fluidly and he's going to move you know even more fluidly than than a you know un uh, unassisted human would um so so that's that's where you know bringing that automotive background into that arena yeah uh, was was such a natural fit so so what's uh what what kind of got you out of the whole car design area like how come you at some point you would have been like oh i want to move into another industry what's that what what kind of created that jump for you well actually the the um the automotive design thing was a detour for me oh, um i okay. always wanted to do concept design for films yeah I mean, literally since i was seven years old oh um, wow that's really early yeah instantly yeah. dating myself but uh <laughs> yeah i mean this this is this is the story of pretty much all of my colleagues of my generation mm. who are in the business i mean you talk to Ryan Church or James Klein or any of those guys, and they all have the same story. They saw Star Wars when they were, you know, pick a number between five years old and 12 years old and were instantly hooked. That's what they wanted to do. Uh, and that was my journey. I mean, you know, I was lucky enough to have parents who, uh, you know, saw a passion in me and didn't say, well, you know, if you've got artistic skill, maybe you should be an architect or something <laughs> safe like that. I mean, immediately went out and got me the Joe Johnson Star Wars sketchbooks. And I probably copied every page of those mm. a dozen times. Um, but that was my goal. And, you know, I went into industrial design and, and automotive design at school because Joe Johnson was an industrial designer. Sid Mead was an industrial designer. I mean, you know that's what there was there wasn't there wasn't Noman. there wasn't art center entertainment design there was none of that mm. uh out there and um so i studied industrial design and uh and senior year of college for me i oh, i'm from canada by the way so, okay yeah so um went to college in canada and uh took a spring break trip to california during my senior year to see if I could interview with all the visual effects companies down in LA. And uh, uh, by coincidence, someone from Nissan Design was in Toronto the week before I left. I showed her my work and uh, she invited me for a tour at Nissan. And on my trip uh, down, I went to San Diego got a tour of Nissan, which turned into an interview, which turned into a job offer. And that's what moved me to California. So oh, cool. yeah, there you go. And so, so within, within a year of working at Nissan, I was also doing some video game stuff with a startup okay. company on yeah. the side. Yeah. So the, the passion was always there for, for mm. sci-fi stuff. Yeah. Did you actually have like firsthand like desi designing cars, like in the sense that you have um, any cars that you've had taken like help take shape or sure uh, yeah sure. Like, I mean I was there for I was there for about four and a half years um, I worked on a number of projects I mean one of the things that uh, that was more of a lure for me to um, you know video games and and uh, movies and stuff is just the the pace at which you design things uh at nissan or in any car studio you can spend a year just designing one object you know one vehicle yeah uh, 
uh, sometimes longer. And then it's, and then it's, you know, another three years past that point b- before the thing shows up on the street. And, you know, while I was doing the video ga- game design stuff on the side, you know, I would design something in a day and by the end of the week, it was already in the game working. Yeah. And it's just like that. And, and then I'd be, you know, designing something else the next day and designing something else the next day, you know, and, and uh, you know, it's so much more interesting and exciting to me yeah so there is there is definitely satisfaction on having you know six months to just come up with concepts for one vehicle and then another six months to take it into a full-size clay model and refine it to the nth degree i mean but uh because <laughs> you have to, you have to get everything perfect right like because you you're oh, doing it yeah. in clay it's like being in zbrush and you're refining the surface and getting it perfect like is it every is, well, are they doing it's, that? It's, yeah i mean it's it's constantly reevaluating where the reflections are falling yeah. and, and all that kind of stuff but then but then every single every single detail you have to put the same amount of effort into you know the, yeah. the integration of the tail lights into the back and and the and the bumpers and you're exploring different ways of you know what's a new way of transitioning from the fender into the hood and you know i mean it, there's a, a degree of refinement that goes into something like that mm. uh that's you know unheard of in in any other industry because yeah. i mean you know even even product design where mm. you have the same you have the same um engineering requirements that you know as things change you have to adjust you know the the hood hood to to windshield touchdown points to clear they just decided they were going to put a new intercooler in it and that's going to make that go up but you know all that kind of stuff and you, you've got that in product design as well but but nothing generates more passion than cars mm. and people i mean you know yeah i mean you know i i personally love to to go out and wax my own car and you know <laughs> it's almost you know, there's an intimacy but that, that happens between men and their cars for some reason. Yeah. Um, but uh, so, you know, there's there's so much refinement that goes mm. into that. Did you object? Did you find the way you were designing cars were kind of like you would always kind of put like a face and like put a face into a car like the it, it kind of like the body type of the human anatomy kind of injected into a car design? Is this the way you would look at car designs or is that a way that people do look at car designs? They try and reflect human anatomy. So there's a, re- a relatability to the car. Is that, is that something that happens? Well, I, in, I think in so, car for sure. Yeah. For sure. I mean, I spent probably at least two years, maybe even three of the time that I was there working on the second generation Pathfinder, mm. Nissan Pathfinder, um, which uh, never, was n- never materialized in the way that we had envisioned it. It, it mm. ultimately got taken over for product placement or product uh, planning and, and marketing reasons by the Japanese studio. But uh, but you know there was there was a lot of in the in the early days of SUV designs because I think you know mm. other than the, the proto SUVs like Jeeps and and things like that, you know that that first generation Pathfinder was one of the first real SUVs and there was definitely a, a musculature to mm. that design, you know, mm. with the with those bulging over, you know, bulging fenders and, and, uh, you know, there was a deliberate attempt to make it feel muscular, which, which we were doing in the second generation. Um, but particularly, um, the, the Japanese auto makers, uh, because of, Japanese culture, they're they're far more sensitive to the face of a car. I mean, the literal yeah. headlights and and uh, grill face of a car than than we are here in in North America. Um, you know, there, there's a there's a very strong cultural uh, push against you know aggressive or mean or negative looking faces to cars. Yeah. Um, and that was something that we encountered a lot. So, I mean, there's these, yeah, there's definitely some interesting anthropomorphizing um, going on in that mm. venue for sure. 
Did do you find because I had a look at the first gen Nissan, and that's like more square and boxy and stuff. Yeah. So what's I've always wondered uh, people's opinion on, um, especially since you've done car design. Like, what is the opinion on why did at some point we had nice rounded cars in the seventies? Is it the seventies and the nineties we went really angular and square and it kind of like it changed. Like, do you know the reasoning for that? Um, yeah, a few things. Well, I mean, sixties was really the the very rounded. Yeah. Cars and then 70s, we started getting into the boxier uh, American cars, uh, 80s, you know, into the early 80s. And then, you know, a, a lot of it has been driven by um, by manufacturing techniques. Yeah. Um, you know, in the uh, up until the, I would say the late 60s, early 70s, uh, there was a lot of handwork in automotive okay. manufacturing a lot of mm. and, and labor is is you know the the number one cost um in in auto manufacturing particularly skilled labor so back in the back in the 60s you had these these very swoopy forms that were that were all one piece and you didn't see any seams between um between you know the rear fender and then the uh the sail panel and then the the hood and then the a pillar and 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 that's because they would mold or they would stamp metal parts and then they would braze them that you know they would join them they would spot weld them and then you'd have someone going in with with a uh you know the welding torch and brazing that joint and then sanding it and hand finishing it yeah and that's an enormous amount of of labor intensive time and yeah. high costs and so in the yeah. 70s with, with cars they did two things they they started um limiting forms to that which could be stamped like the the depth of a of a stamping um has an effect on the amount you know the the thickness of sheet metal that you can use because that sheet metal stretches mm. um, so they were doing shallower stampings um and they were uh, trying to eliminate as much hand brazing as possible between forms. Mm. And so a lot of that led to, you know, you've got a flat panel here and a flat panel here and a flat panel here and a flat panel here. So there was, there was a, a manufacturing process and cost um, aspect to it. And then also in the, in the early 70s, you had, you know, Bertone in particular and Pininfarina and all the Italian designers that were sort of the, the leading edge going from things like, you know, the Lamborghini Miura to the mm. Lamborghini Countach or, yeah. you know, from, from the Ferrari Dino to, you know, the, the, the 308 series that were, you know, the wedge design. Mm. Um, so that was an aesthetic that influenced everybody as well. So you got this this big transition, um, and then you know when we started getting into uh, you know the late eighties and the nineties, um, uh, with, particularly with uh, things like bumper areas and stuff like that. I mean, you'll you'll remember back then, you know, the bumper was a separate thing. It was mm. it. Was, chrome it might have you know these big rubber things on it or yeah and then where in the mid 80s you'd have these sort of rubber or plastic accordion bits that connected it to the body uh and hid the seam and stuff and then and then in the uh in the 80s you started to get molded bumpers because uh you know injection molding of urethane parts was a new technology that was available so all of a sudden you start having things that are more integrated into the body and that starts you know that translates into a new ability to create smooth integrated forms mm. and and again that starts prompting another um uh form language development and everybody clues onto that and then you get yeah you know and then and then you know you had things like the ford taurus and the 
in the 80s and early 90s that people described as just a bar of soap that's been used for a long time you know <laughs> and, then there's a, and then there was a reaction to that and you got into ford's new edge design <laughs> which was all flat planes and yeah you know so there's there's a lot of a lot of factors that go into it and and reactions to reactions to other things and, yeah. and integrating of new technologies and and now i think we're in a place where you know those various aesthetics are being used to differentiate brands i mean mm. lamborghini has taken the faceted design to you know to its ultimate conclusion while ferrari is getting into far more organic forms yeah. than they did back in the testarossa days and you know there's you know the, the 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 technology is not as much of a limitation now as it used to be mm. um, now I'm you can pretty much make any form you want so with with ferrari and lamborghini are they how are they going about making their cars now because you say it has a lot of um, facets like it has because i'm looking at lamborghini and it has a lot of flat surfaces and these angular forms and because my opinion on Lamborghini is they've gotten a bit, I don't know, what's your opinion on Lamborghinis? Have they gotten a bit funny or they they have this, um, I don't know, like Ferrari seems to be going in the way of um, the old school, uh, where they came from, essentially. Mm -hmm. Is is the the way they're engineering these, these forms, because Ferrari's got more round forms and a little bit of the angular form. And mm -hmm. I, I think that looks way better than uh, what Lamborghini's doing at the moment. What's the process for the two different companies? They, they're, they're trying just to defend, like, be different from one another, like, because they don't want to kind of fall into the same look. Are they doing? Is this what they're doing? Or, I, I mean, I think there's at least since the '80s, they kind of branched off. I mean, mm. there was a time when, when Lamborghini. Um, and Ferrari were targeting the same market uh, back in the early 70s, you know, with the Mura and the Dino. It was mm. very, very sexy forms. Yeah. That, um, it's almost considered their best car the, with the Mura, like, isn't it? Like, almost their best. Well, I, I, I think um, it's yeah. their yeah. most beautiful car for yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but that's also, I mean, that's a matter of taste. I mean, mm. I, I think. I think the design that they're doing right now is excellent, but it's for a specific market. I think mm. since since the days of the uh, the Countach and the Diablo, um, they've been targeting a, a much different market than Ferrari. Ferrari has always pursued sort of this very quintessential refinement, mm. uh, whereas Lamborghini, uh, I think, has found that their market is flashier. Um, yeah. you know, we, I, I used to joke that it's, you know, it's, it's the, it's the Trans Am for rich people. Right? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's a car that's designed to make a statement. I mean, it's mm. Darth Vader on wheels. Yeah. Right? Like, <laughs> yeah. You, you do not drive a Lamborghini to look sophisticated. You drive a Lamborghini to show off. Yeah. I mean, it attracts attention. It is mm. designed to be the most outrageous thing on you know on wheels mm. um and, and there was a you can even see that transition if you look at the uh the history of the lamborghini countach i mean the original countach was very simple mm. you know was this this very simple wedge it had these you know very unique uh fender forms um and uh but it was but it was a beautiful simple refined shape and then yeah. you know and then they started putting these over fenders on it and these giant wings oh. on the back and yeah. you know, it just became this this you know like fun, body. fun. like and and you look yeah. Yeah, i mean you have to look at the color palettes of mm. these cars you look at ferraris and they're you know the most outrageous you'll get is is like a a bright racing yellow but ferrari yeah. coming purple and lime green and flip <laughs> paint and you know they're they're really just made to attract attention and they do very well mm. at attracting attention you you cannot ignore a ferrari no sorry a lamborghini yeah um yeah i'm looking at them now they really so the lamborghini countach lp 400 that looks really nice 
that's that's like a statement right there like but it still has it's not crazy it, lamborghini yet it's um it's the angular but the, they do have so many different versions of them i never realized how many different versions they've got of uh, the lamborghini i really thought they just had um two different versions the one they had the angular one and they the one with the wing and the fenders but um mm -hmm. yeah it's crazy how how much they they kind of went through i think uh because they were they were very much in like battle and i guess that's how they uh were going to to d divide off and um essentially if you copy somebody else someone else you end up just kind of like always chasing them and i think ferrari always led uh led the pact but um i always found that inter interesting story when ford you know when ford made their car to yeah. go in competition against ferrari the gp40 yeah. yeah yeah that was that was really nice and that was like the that it was kind of like not following it's kind of like the the angular not it wasn't really there's was no angular lines it was always like it was almost like a it's an american ferrari almost i don't know what you would want to call it but but it was very well, interesting if, take. in the Ford versus ferrari movie you you know yeah. the emotional story behind that. yeah i've watched that it was um, great yeah and it's you know it's it's kind of the same story with lamborghini i mean mm. the you know, I don't. I don't know. I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but the the story is that uh, Signor Lamborghini, who was a manufacturer of tractors, um, wanted to buy a Ferrari from Mr. Ferrari, and for some reason, Ferrari refused to sell him one, and uh, and he got pissed, and he was like, "Well, fine, I'll make my own," and mm. or some variation of that story. I don't know if I'm telling it right, but there mm. there was definitely some bad blood between ferrari and lamborghini at the beginning of this so yeah no it's really it's really interesting and th this is why because I, I was really i'm really surprised that uh well not really surprised but seeing that you have that automotive background and it shows all in your work and that's awesome i think uh because you you have that refinement and you saying that you're that under you're talking about how highlights hit and the way lines work and things like that that's that's something that i really look towards doing in design work and things like that and you're you're really paying attention to it and that's what i saw in everything that you do and you're paying attention to it and but uh like i've always been very interested in car designs because it, it's kind of like that it's super super refined and like it is it like obsess it's obsessive isn't it a car like, <laughs> it is for yeah. sure and, and i'm i'm pretty obsessive with uh with the iron man suit designs too yeah, i mean i can see it know. yeah and it's uh it's a challenge in this industry because um you know there's always this aspect of of trying to explain to your client mm. the thing that they don't know that they don't know you know like uh, like they're they don't have the language to understand sometimes why we need to put more time into refining the design mm. right because it's like well that looks great what's wrong with that that's good enough right i mean yeah and and uh you know trying to trying to get that refinement and also you know when you're when you're handing off a design you know even if you've done a 3d model of it or or, or a z sculpt of it to the visual effects department and then trying to maintain a certain degree of control as they need to as they need to make changes for practical reasons uh you know later on down the pipe and and trying to maintain uh that refinement even when changes are made it can be very difficult because you know you move one line in a certain way and all of a sudden you throw the entire thing off yes yes it's very true isn't it you, that's yeah. that's that's why um like so when when i work you have that sign off period right when with a client you're like okay are you happy with this like it's a sketch i'm gonna refine right. it if you tell me you want to change something here like it's it's going to throw it off it will ruin it in a sense and that's yeah. i think um conveying that to a client is difficult and well, and, I, and yeah. I see that in your work too i mean mm. it you know there's there's a lot of detail but nothing feels arbitrary mm. um you know even if it doesn't have a function 
it looks like it has a function, like yeah. it's completely convincing. And that's <laughs> yeah. one of the things that, you know, I, I particularly love in your work is mm. that everything looks like it has a very specific function. I mean, if there's some little gnarly knob sticking out of something, mm. I know that you have an idea <laughs> of what accessory is going to attach to that thing. Yeah. And, how. and yeah. even if you don't, you've convinced me that yeah. you have. I have the, the that's our goal yeah. as conceptual designers is the 50 50 rule 50 50 the, yeah well the illusion of functionality yeah well i mean since you've come from industrial design you would be like well i mean a car handle is a car handle that opens and functions but for creative designs you have to kind of let go you have to breathe a bit let go let things flow and because it won't be fun otherwise like the the fun will be sucked out of it it's like hey that doesn't do anything this doesn't do anything and it's like it's going to look boring like in in a way it would look it wouldn't look boring but it would just look um very aesthetically interesting but i think that those things uh you know how you have the video game world and then you have the industrial design world we're kind of like yeah like kind of marrying the two and um for sure yeah that's and i mean you know i i feel like you and Vitali and Gavriel and and um, oh um, uh, I, I'm trying to think of a few of the, I, you know I, I kind of see you guys as kind of this this new breed of hard surface designer <laughs> who brought in this this yeah. new language of like hyper hyper functional hyper detailed mm. uh, hard surface you know robotics and you know it's it's a design language that's that's driven from you know industrial processes and you know things things don't feel as much uh mold as as they do milled out sort of bespoke mm. you know cnc machined and mm. and uh you know it's 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 very exciting and it's it's a language of sort of hyper realistic in a sense like it's got more detail than something probably would yeah for the function that it's <laughs> going to do it's, it's like it's like taking taking the existing functional aesthetic and then accelerating it in a way yeah, uh, yeah. to make it more exciting um and uh yeah no it's 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 a very it's a very exciting design language because it mm. it just it gives you so much stuff to look at. You know yeah. what I mean? You can you can you can stare at one of your helmets for a week without closing without blinking <laughs> and, and continue to find you know interesting uh, interesting form language and interesting mm. details. Um, yeah. Well, that, that's what that's what I find great with because um, have you have you used like subdivision modeling and things like that? Where you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I find that's like um, it's like the mixture of CAD and uh, organic modeling. It's like the two happy mediums, and when you do mm -hmm. work with that, and then you put CAD on top of it, you get that kind of mixture of the old school and the new school type of right. uh, modeling. But uh, I, I have you tried using any CAD modern day CAD like Fusion or uh, Moi Moi? Have you tried? Um... I, I haven't, no, no, I haven't. And, yeah. and you know, one of the one of the biggest challenges that I have in the kind of work that I do, particularly with sub D modeling, is you know when I was doing NURBS modeling, you know, you create a perfect surface, mm. and then if you want to punch something into that perfect surface you know whether it's an air intake or or you know bolts or anything like that you know you do a trim and it doesn't disturb the surface but when you're working in in sub d modeling you create this perfect surface but the minute you put another uh edge in there it's just mm -hmm. changed your surface it's just so so how you get to um you know, boolean out something without disrupting your perfect reflective surface is mm. is a challenge. And for me, you know, uh, you know, because I've I've been Moto for for the last little while, and they just introduced you know their sort of version of Fusion. Yeah. Um, 
uh, in in Modo, and it's it creates such complication for me because you know again I've I've tried to refine the surface to get the reflections to fall just the way I want, but now I've got a you know, even just cutting in a door cut or, a, or anything like that, mm. all of a sudden it's pinching my surface and it's not creating this tangential flow through it. Um, you know, and, and you have to do so much sort of pixel level work or, or you know, point level work yeah. to get it back to that surface once you cut an edge in. Mm. Um, or you have to, or you have to define it with the edges already in place where you're mm. going to cut your lines and all that, you know, it's this level of, of noise to your creativity. That's yeah. That's a challenge. And then even with the, with, you know, adding on the fusion layer and the Boolean layer, um, the minute you do that, you've, you've just lost your very simple cage to refine that surface and you can't change the surface anymore. I mean, other yeah. than, other than maintaining history, yeah, uh, you know the the minute you freeze that, you've got this extremely finely tessellated surface yeah. that you just can't touch. You're done. Uh, yeah, you're cooked. Like if you want to go back yeah. and change something. Like, yeah, like... exactly. If you want to if you want to do any, you know, gross changes, which you know, other than going into a to a mesh modifier or whatever mm. and, and doing a global change, but even that can can mess with. I, you know, the refinement of the surface. Yeah, I think you got to commit. You got to commit to it. Like it's as soon as you're you're done, you're done. You be like, okay, I'm done. I have to move this. You know, like a one, two, three step. You can't be like one, and then you're like, you kind of like, oh, I want to go two, and then then you want to go back to one. You can't like you have to just do one, two, three, and that's it. You're done. Like you're you you have to just. There's no going back. No going back. And I think. Well, I mean, that's, yeah. that is that is the beauty of of nerves modeling is that you know it's always maintaining history it's always you know you create a surface and you cut into it and it's not changing the surface at all mm. you know it's just creating trim curves and then you can you know you can radius those those trim intersections and stuff i mean uh, there are a lot of problems <laughs> working in nerves oh, yes. a lot of frustration working in nerves for sure but for for the purposes of extremely refined surface development, there's no substitute. Yeah. Uh, but then again, I haven't worked in it since the nineties. I mean, yeah. since my car design days, because it's, it's just not practical for, I don't think it's any, <laughs> it's not much better. <laughs> so I, <laughs> I've used fusion and Moy and stuff. It's not, I think it's still where it, it's a little bit better, but it's still, if you picked it up now, you'd be like, you're still banging your head against the table at the time. So, <laughs> so. But I, like so when when you have uh the iron man designs they're making oh. all those in subdivision surfaces right some some poor fella has to make make your designs in subdivision sure. surfaces like yeah. do you see, do you see all that get made do you have any input on those things I, I used to i used to um you know up until relatively recently um you know, most of those suits were built to some degree practically. And, you know, we worked very closely hand in hand with Stan Winston, now Legacy Studios, mm. uh, to make those practical suits. So I would do designs, uh, I would send them designs, uh, and then I would be sent um, to Legacy and, and basically sit beside their modelers for a couple of weeks and be embedded oh, in Legacy cool. That's awesome. to yeah. art direct the process of translating that into um, into sub D surface models that they could print, right? Because that mm. was ultimately the goal was for them to be able to print those things out and and make uh, practical suits. Mm. Um, over the years, um, the amount of practical uh, appliances that that uh, the actors would be wearing had have gotten smaller and smaller and smaller. They still go through that process. Um, but now that, um, now that, well, for one, we, we did a lot of that in-house. Um, uh, we have hired several people from Legacy, Legacy 3D modelers um, to work directly at Marvel. So, 
Josh Herman was, you know, our first in-house modeler. And he was, he was, uh, the artist who did, I think the Mark seven, um, at legacy, uh, back in the day. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, and then, um, uh, sorry, my brain is a little fried, but, uh, That's you know, right. Adam Ross is, is our current in-house oh. 3d model. He comes from legacy as well. And he was yeah. one of the people that we would work with there. Um, and so we're, we're doing a lot more of that in-house. And so, yeah, we're working directly with these guys mm. and, and also, you know, more of us are, you know, skilled and trained on ZBrush now. So there's a little less of that, you know, hand waving translation because, you know, when, when I hand off a ZBrush, uh, you know, a Z tool for an Iron Man suit, the surfaces are all there. The cut lines are all there. You know, it's more of a process of them then taking that, you know, fitting it to the actor, moving things around so that, uh, you know, works functionally better for, mm. for the parts that are going to be built practically, uh, you know, and they may come back and say, Hey, you know, I think we need an extra cut line here so that, you know, we can get better shoulder movement or, or whatever it happens to be. Mm. Um, but there's a lot less of that now than there used to be because everything is, is much more digital and, you know, they'll, they'll have sort of the football pads, you know, chest and chest and shoulders. And that's about what they'll wear. Uh, and mm. that's enough, enough, um, uh, you know, lighting reference and contact reference and stuff, you know, or, or the arms and gloves and, yeah. and helmet, um, you know, for on set enough reference for VFX to take over and, and, um, do their thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's a lot, a lot easier with the translation once we're doing our own models first mm. and handing them off because proportions are there, surface refinement is there. Mm. Uh, you know, there'll, there'll be a certain amount of, of uh, explaining what the intent is. But, uh, you how, know. How long do they spend on these suits? Like, how long did they used to, like, take to make one Iron Man suit from, from you to, like, finished? I'm sure it takes, like, a year, wouldn't it? Well, the, the, uh, I mean, the first time around, it took nine months total. Yeah. Um, for, for, you know, the Mark II and Mark III. Mm. That was a nine month process. It was about six months of design and three months of, of practical suit building um, between uh, myself and Adi Granov doing the design and then, you know, Stan Winston Studios doing their 3D model and then, you know, building the practical suit mm. um so but there was so much problem solving to be done there i mean we spent a lot of time uh also working with uh plf doing previs working out uh what we were trying to do with for example the 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 ab plates and torso plates trying to find a way to design those and a way to to move those and and rig those in such a way that you were minimizing the amount of, of rubberiness, you know, digital rubberiness or, yeah. or interpenetration that would happen. Cause mm. you know, if, if you think of, of, uh, you know, cross section through the middle of a torso is more oval shaped than, than round. And, you know, mm. you can't spin an oval within an oval, right? So you've got to come up with ways of arranging these plates so that they would actually be flexible in real life. Um, yeah, you know, and, and, you know, tricky areas such as, you know, the hip joints or, or the, you know, shoulder and, you know, like we don't, we don't move our arms up, like from a pivot, we have, you know, this, this scapula and, um, and collarbone cradle that sort of lifts the whole shoulder area in a pivot from, you know, the base of the neck. Right. So, mm. you know, all of that stuff has to be taken into consideration in a hard suit and, you know, how are we going to design the cut lines and stuff? And, you know, we, we probably did more exploration in that and, and, uh, 
and and design problem solving in that that was actually necessary for the practical suit. I mean, if you look at the the cut lines around the arc reactor on the Mark II and three, um, you know, it's designed as like a concentric circle, and and the the chest plates were actually designed to rotate around that to lift up with the arms as the arms lifted up. Mm. And you know, it's it's a detail that I don't think is ever seen in the movie, but I mean, that was the degree to which we went in terms of trying to figure out all the practical aspects of how this would actually work. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of that problem solving was done the first time around and, uh, you know, dealing with uh, how to design this for comfort level. Um, you know, the, the big one, of course, is proportions. Uh, and that's something you know, we had to deal with, uh, in a big way, uh, from the get go. Cause I mean, you, you think about superhero proportions, right? Superhero proportions are eight to 10 heads high. Whenever you're looking at yeah. designing a human figure, you're looking at it proportionally using the head as the unit, mm. right? And the heroic proportion, I mean, I'm, I'm six foot two, but I'm probably only about six head six heads high or something like that mm, right six yeah. and a half maybe a superhero is anything from eight to ten heads high depending on whether you're looking at rob liefeld uh image comics from the 90s yeah. or yeah or something yeah. a little bit more contemporary but you know that's that's the aesthetic right and and you know the minute i put a motorcycle helmet on my head i'm like five heads high because yeah. all of a sudden the unit of measurement gets this big yeah. so how do we possibly make you know mm. a five foot seven actor look like <laughs> yeah. Hero, right? yeah so you know that was a lot of that a lot of like where can we put the show how far mm. out can we put the shoulders without the you know the inner pivot point of the shoulder mm. making it look unrealistic you know how much lift can we put and hide in the design of the boots you know how how close to the body can we make the helmet so that we minimize that unit of measurement? Um, you know, those those two sort of circular ear discs that protrude from the helmet were literally designed so that they could contain the ear so that the rest of the helmet could be as close to the skin yeah. as possible, right? Like a lot of these things were were designed specifically to get as close to that, you know, seven and a half, eight and a half head high superhero proportion, mm. you know, and, and, you know, we were designing for, um, you know, let's say we can get away with a seven and a half head high proportion for the practical suit, you know, can we then take the digital suit and bring it to eight and a half heads high without it cluing off the audience that you're looking at two different things. I mean, there's yeah. a lot of stuff that goes into figuring out those kinds of things. But mm. once we solved all of those problems in the first Iron Man, that was sort of second nature, mm. right? And also the first Iron Man, the goal was to have it, you know, 75% practical in camera and 25% digital mm. post VFX. And by the time the movie was finished, it was the other way around. I mean, 25% of the shots are practical. 75% of them are, are yeah. you know, digital or digitally enhanced. Mm. Uh, because, you know, it just looked so good. I mean, mm. they did such an amazing job yeah, of, did. of uh, translating that. Mm. So, and since then, it's it's been even more. I mean, there's mm. just, there are no fully practical shots left in it, it is in it. it is such a well-designed suit like i always thought iron man suit was so well designed and you did you have a take on all the suits i assume everything as soon as they got you on the first they pretty much continued to use uh, you? the only movie i haven't worked on that had the iron man suit in it was iron man 2 yeah um i was on tron legacy at the time so mm. so uh that, that, I it, did, that it that just was shows it was fun. such solid design like i remember seeing the um for the iron man one the chrome version of the suit in a like a, a cg shot and that's that's like it looks so good rendered and looked real like real but i think it was cg and it just everything looked like so well balanced and so much thought because i love suit designs like i'm a 
I'm big on suit designs and helmets and I, things I, like I that. I gather that in your work. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, like I love, I love the thing. And because when you start talking about uh, proportions, that's what I had to do with full character suits that I've done. I've had sure. to jack them up because you're like they look too short. And then yeah, as soon as you put a helmet on somebody, it just messes everything up. And so Absolutely. you get and the big head syndrome. <laughs> so, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, go, go back and look at stormtroopers with fresh <laughs> eyes. You just go like, oh my gosh. I yeah. Mean, yeah. Cool when I was a kid. And now I look at them and it's like, they're bobbleheads. They're just <laughs> bobbleheads. Well, I, I, the funny thing is I actually tried to do my own version of a stormtrooper and I tried to oh. like copy the original didn't work because i realized the proportions are off and it just fails they are so yeah. corny like real corny <laughs> I, think I think that's why space balls came out and they made such a, a funny funny thing of the hem you know space balls the darth vader helmet head um being so big so from space balls it was just hilarious yeah, yeah. yeah. But, dark helmet but yeah that, no this it's it's i'm really I've been pleasantly surprised by talking to you because you're um, so clued on to everything that has has like all the kind of minutiae details that I think some people just forget that people pay attention to. And like, it's the reason why when you look at your work, you get excited for looking at a design. And I think um, with the CG world that we live in, we get obsessed with doing details and there's an obsessive compulsive part of like more details. If I have more details, it will be better, but they're forgetting about, they're forgetting about lines and how things flow. And that's really important. Like I, I would say that if your line work doesn't look good and with no details, your design will never look good. Even if you put all the details on it, you're, yep. you're, you're trying to convince people that you're more technical. And I think um, that's that's technical. It's not artistic. And I think there's always there's always value on art. And I and I'd love to see more of that, especially since since you're doing it. and it's, you're you you haven't like you haven't like fallen into the. I don't think you ever will fall into the, like obsessively adding detail. I don't think you will. <laughs> You're ingrained. Well, yeah. the, the funny thing is um, that. I have been obsessively searching for simplicity mm. in in my journey, career-wise. Um, can we take a short yeah, break? Sure. And I'm going to change yeah. venue. I don't know if your blog is is no, video no. or, no, or we audio, can do it. but I'll I need just, to. I'll pause I'm, it. I'm actually in a bedroom right now that yeah. one of my dogs has to go into. That's all right. Now I'll just I'll stop it and we can so start again. All right. Yeah. I'm gonna transition up. Yeah, I'll just start. Uh, you go uh, again from here. Yeah. Simplicity. You know, it was something that was ingrained uh, with me at Nissan is is mm. finding finding one simple design language and then applying it to everything and and having echoes of you know finding one sort of defining line or defining shape or defining mm. surface and echoing that and repeating that across the body so everything has has a uh, a flow and uh yeah you know that's something that i you know i guess it's mm. if there's a signature to my work it's that flow you yeah. know having is, things lead the eye around and, and is, uh, is there anything that you study specifically like books or anything like that or are you just kind of going off by um observation and feeling and emotion to to your work I, I don't know i mean like anybody else i guess just mm. just taking things in you know trying to be inspired by whatever i see out in the world yeah uh, that kind of exploration um and you know i mean certainly the the iron man suits have gone from very very simple to very very complex i think mm. Uh, you know, when you compare the Mark III to the Mark, you know, any of the, the later, you know, Mark 42, 45, 46 suits, mm. uh, you know, the, the Mark 42 from Iron Man 3, which uh, Ryan Minerjing Ding chiefly designed, and, and I did some design work on it as well. Mm. Uh, you know the the complexity of panel breakup in that 
mm. was defined by story once again you know the the idea that he could you know just have all of these pieces levitate you know with repulsors and form themselves on him you know he could call them from a distance and they would assemble themselves on him so mm. that required a much more complex um part breakup than we previously had and that created its own aesthetic and then with the mark uh 45 in avengers uh age of ultron that was a cool I, one i'm looking at take that mm. and bring it back into the more organic more anatomical forms yeah and so, but but the, it definitely and also i think you know a lot of the the stuff that you guys have been doing that's far more complex has sort of become you know more of an expectation more of a standard in mm. in tech design um and i think people have you know you you get uh, you get very used to a particular thing and that becomes an expectation right yeah mm. the, the standard the, quality, the, the level of quality is defined by something specific i mean you know what what is your what is your touch point what's your reference point yeah uh, and uh you know it's it, it's it's shifted from ferraris and and aircraft to more um uh you know more like tanks and equipment you know where you've got a lot more complexity mm. um so yeah i know it's it's interesting it's been an interesting journey I, I i still i hope uh you still do the whole um you know the very painterly not i um, mean the airbrushy type of look i still hope you do that because it's it's such a like i'm looking at um so the iron man 3 mark xl shotgun is it shotgun hyper velocity armor yeah, yeah, so sure. Though that is that using the um, the alpha method, uh, using the alpha map method in Photoshop, because it's just yeah, it's, that one was yeah. How, how long do you spend on kind of refining these things? Um, well, generally speaking, everything is defined by when our presentations are, mm. and we'll have a presentation. I would say every two weeks, generally. Yeah. You know, every every second friday we'll have a presentation to the director and kevin feige and you know the the brain trust at marvel um and the expectation is that we'll have you know three to four variations to show them three to four designs so that mm. that kind of defines it uh and i will generally i will work what i the way i usually work is i'll start the week and i'll i'll lay out roughly four designs four silhouettes um and uh and i'll sort of work on those three or four or five simultaneously so that i mean you know yeah. partly partly the goal being to not get so bogged down in one that i get to you know mm. three days before the presentation and i haven't started the other three you know what i mean yes so yeah. i'll work I'll, I'll just get them all to a particular level mm. where i've where i've sort of defined what the color breakups are and what the form language is going to be and what the the graphic cut line language is going to be um for each one and then i'll just sort of with whatever time i have left i'll just take them equally to a degree of refinement that that you know will will present them in a good light yeah uh, and sometimes that means that you know the lower legs and the feet are hidden in artfully placed smoke because <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> worked out you know everything yeah. starts with, everything starts with the the torso and a helmet and yeah. uh, and then i work out from there and when i have to do forearms and and calves it's like oh god i've got to come up with some shape for the forearm now oh. it's com it's com complicated because you have to get things to move around those those type of joints right like you have to think about proportions and how like wrists wrists and like feet are always just they're tricky to do in general right so oh, yeah yeah and 
And by the time you get to them, you're exhausted. You know, it's like, <laughs> oh God, you know, I've got this form language I've designed. How am I going to wrap that around a forearm? Because I've already done it everywhere else in the body and I got to do yeah. something interesting. And, and, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting, uh, challenge. And also we're always playing around with, you know, conceptually functional areas. I mean, with the Mark 45, if you look at the way the cut lines are, 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 um, placed and, sorry, I'm, it's, you know, it's, it's sort of like following the musculature because mm. I've always had basically either a, a, a long cuff that was attached to the glove that would rotate around the forearm mm. or, or a, you know, gauntlet or whatever along the forearm that's fixed to the forearm. And then the pivot point is at the wrist, you know, mm. but either way, there's no attachment, you know, there's no, there, it doesn't have that anatomical translation of twisting around from, you know, as these two bones twist. Right. And mm. so that was the goal with the Mark 45 forearm was, was trying to get it to work in the same way. So you had, you know, a sophisticated breakup of plates so that those would actually twist so that, you know, your connection is fixed here and fixed there mm. and the plates would overlap and twist as, you know, so it's all that kind of thinking that goes into yeah that stuff. But yeah, I can see where the plates would, I assume the metal would be some, somewhat rubbery in the animation because it, it's almost impossible to did you ever get some actual physical moving rigid metal parts to move in a way that you never thought could be possible or is it all just like a bit of bullshit on you know, top we, we, <laughs> so. do that. we have done that yeah. digitally it's surprising yeah. like you look at a lot of different things like you look at watch bands and you mm. look at um i don't know if you've ever seen those those sort of colanders that that have overlapping metal plates that you open up and put yeah. into your like a steamer, you know, yeah. those, yeah, I think so. I think they look, they look yeah. like a little, uh, uh, lunar Rover radar dish when yeah. you open them up. Yeah. I think rated metal, but there's, there's a lot of ways that compound surfaces, hard surface can, can actually shift over each other. So I think mm. you can, get, you could get 90% of the way there. Yeah. Realistically. Yeah. Um, I think there's always going to be certainly just for the, the efficiency of VFX yeah uh, you're going to be faking a lot of that yeah uh, and why wouldn't you right like why why would you spend the time to make it absolutely believable uh, when yeah. when everything is shot in such a frenetic mm. motion blurred way right yeah. so um i mean we never we never try to do it practically but yeah but uh when you're actually get a good animator to rig that in 3d and you can see just how far you can get before things uh, interpenetrate or pull off of each other so far that it doesn't look high tolerance anymore, mm. you'd be surprised at what you can actually do. Yeah, because I imagine somewhere around the, the torso, you would have to say if you have a plate there, it would have to just squeeze a little bit with each one that would have to be in the animation of um, the rigging. So each plate would just deform you would have the shoulder and it would just deform enough and you're then configuring a way to get the plates to slide and then just shift and deform without the eye catching that deformation in, right. in it. This is but, but the interesting, the interesting the thing that we found, mm. particularly with the toughest area, which is, you know, the, 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 um, the midriff section and the amount of twist and bend that that goes through, the more plates you have, it's remarkable how little each one has to move to create a much larger movement mm. overall. Mm. Um, so you can get away with quite a bit, you know, the, the more, the more you break that up. So, mm. you know, in later designs where we've got a much more breakup than, than in the Mark three, it's actually easier for that to be, um, you know, translated to, to animation than, than which we, when we had a much simpler suit. Yeah. Was there much study on like medieval armor and things like that? Oh, absolutely, for sure. Yeah. Cause that's, and, that's really good stuff. Mm. And, and it's amazing how high tolerance that stuff is too. I mean, some mm. of that stuff is pretty spectacular. We did, yeah. 
did um, rent a suit of an actual suit of armor uh, during the first movie and had it brought into the studio oh, nice. to look at it and study it. And yeah. that stuff is amazing. Mm. Uh, you know, medieval engineering of just like hammering these things to fit and and just how fluid you you can get with those things without yeah. having any gaps is yeah is spectacular. Yeah, it's very fascinating the the fact that we had to roll walk around in armor to protect ourselves from getting knived. <laughs> so, yeah, without any power assist. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's fascinating to me because though you can see how far they took it and they went very elegant because they'll I, you can imagine wearing it, it would give you a sense of ego as well, especially and you can see how they added all the in like uh, engravings and things like that and like the I think what do they used to cost up to I think. I think a base um, you used to have like base ones that cost ten thousand dollars and then a hundred thousand and then I think up close to a million. Like I think even back then they would, they would spend so much money on doing these suits, and it was just it's it's fascinating to um because we're we're doing it we do it now. I think we're gonna probably start. It'll be interesting to see what we can do now with like if um the Iron Man suit would actually be you know how they're trying to do that now with military sure. stuff. It would yeah. be interesting and i mean you never know they might get you, get you to do do that type of thing because i know with uh vitaly i've chatted to him and they right. get him to because he's doing the you know the game movie stuff yeah. they they get him to do the, the real life stuff so it's, i know yeah you look at his his work and it's yeah. so convincing it's mm. it's hard to believe that it doesn't work i mean yeah it, it, it's, i can imagine all of these companies looking at that stuff and going <laughs> we gotta get this guy because he's got it figured out well i think it's it's um it's like trying to add style because you you come from that background of like i think we didn't you know like how you kind of if you start in a certain area you kind of preconceived to thinking like that and then yeah. so if you want people to be more creative with your designs and you get someone who's like creative and then rein them in and then pull them into a more narrow um to go look it has to be like this you need to do this right. like that and but that's where you said that you're you're un, you're kind of untraining those really strict rigid understandings and then sure. pushing them into there and that's that's why i love uh, working with uh, zbrush and making uh, hard surface and suits because as you know you can do anything but then it's yep. up to you to refine the surface and make it almost cad like all right Right. In, in in that sense which is really difficult and that's there's a level of um mastery that comes in and like you gotta uh, you gotta really train yourself to do it and it's like it's very easy to um, make things look like um rubber and mush and just muddy and stuff like that and, but that's what i found out really fascinating because you you have those such like rounded surfaces but then square edged surfaces really refined and that's what you find in um if uh if cad was if mo like say um nerbs modeling was really easy you'd yeah. have an iron man suit you would have already done it in there <laughs> if you could so it's you've um you've really got that that look and so like you have um what is it there a really big bulky one it's like uh, i think it's like a what's it called the Hulk Buster or uh the hammerhead one like that's pretty crazy like that really you got really rounded surfaces into into the square surfaces and then you've got more so the hammerheads it's like the blue one i think it's meant to be underwater underwater yeah it's, it's yeah. basically a bell diving suit kind of deal yeah that's, I mean, that's almost it's almost made out of primitives it's very mm. very simple but still it's it's rounded enough to the, to the point that like just, i just i just like your take on it like the things that you've done with the hands like it's really interesting i find it like that's cool i, I wouldn't have thought of doing, doing something like that with the hands and like you've fully engrossed it in you, you haven't made hands hands it's just little fingers which is really yeah. i mean it's <laughs> that's really interesting like it's super interesting take on it i haven't seen anyone in in terms of doing design stuff i haven't seen anyone do stuff like that so yeah that's what i mean it's like really interesting design um i, I don't know how it would i'm not sure how it would move it that never got tested 
did it as a actual yeah, I mean, this was a, this was a secondary background suit it yeah. wasn't a hero suit so there wasn't a lot of time spent on that you know mm. i mean this was iron man 3 where it was like they told us okay well you know we're gonna have the scene at the end where where he's gonna call up all the suits he's been working on and this is gonna show just how obsessive and crazy he is because mm. you know, we think that he's you know just done these refinements of these suits and then we realize that you know the suit that he has now you know in the last movie he had the mark 7 mm. and in this movie is the mark 42 and you're like what the hell yeah. you know so there's going to be like 50 other suits that are going to come out at the end and and, and it's like oh my god we got to what <laughs> so we had to come up with you know maybe a dozen or more a dozen or 20 i can't remember how many prototype suits and then vfx was basically going to cut and paste pieces of each to fill out the rest of the mm. the uh what did they call it the uh the house party protocol um so you know mm. that's where shotgun and and uh um you know the stealth suit sneaky mm. yeah, the director named those not me okay yeah <laughs> good descriptions of uh i like to try and name the 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 feeling of the suit reflecting the name you know like if it's silent or it's like a infiltration or it's to there's a story behind it so it just helps tie tie things up and but uh yeah like i the avengers what is it the age of ultron uh ultron concept one i remember saying that one uh that's 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 you got like super organic versions and then more um what is it a rigid version of it mm -hmm. I, I always thought that was a very like especially the head and um i think yeah uh, so where the bicep or well, the not the bicep the shoulder meets the chest so uh -huh. i'm looking at uh what is it, it says you're your favorite design so ryan yeah. uh what's ryan meet Ryan Minerding has, Minerding? has yeah. Awesome. yeah that's really cool and it's just it's it's solid design work it really is solid design work I, I really love it thank you it's just you know it's on point and the rendering is really nice <laughs> like it just you've got automotive like you've got good design it's perfect for suit designs really is so I think big inspiration to me especially and just it's, talking it's, to you has like it's fine one now. approach to it I mean mm yeah it's, uh, like I, I honestly wouldn't know where to start to uh to, to get to the level of like just instant believability that i get from the stuff that you're working on like oh. uh, you know that that police costume is is just very inspirational because it's it just looks like it exists it yeah. really it doesn't feel <laughs> It doesn't feel like fantasy at all. I mean, mm. that's the, the bizarre thing about it is you go, I know there's something real like that out there. And you and then you do a search on the internet. You can't find anything <laughs> that looks anything like it. And yet there it is. And it just it mm. just tells you like, of course, it that you know, mm. that's out there. People are using that. Right? Yeah. It's it's a place placing some believability stuff and I made like a pen and the camera and you know, like a walkie talkie. You're placing all those uh, visual cues to make you go and click and so yeah, it's um absolutely i, I mean it's, it's hand holding it's, a, it's mm. a total magic trick yeah. because you're convincing people mm. not just that this thing is believable when they look at it for the first time but you're convincing them that they've already seen it and it's <laughs> you know, that they could walk out of their house and they would actually bump into one of those on the street it's almost yeah. like it's almost like you're you're like reverse filling their memory. It's yeah. so convincing that they convince themselves that that it was already there beforehand. Mm. Yeah, and that, that's something with the face. It's like an up up down. Um, what is it? A smiley face? You know, like a Joker kind of thing. Because it, it's saying maybe sometimes the police can be corrupt. So let me smile for you. But it's uh -huh. menacing at the same time. So it, I I have a twist on that. It's like. I want to, I want to be menacing because how would it be menacing? And when you were talking about putting facial features on helmets, I really like to do that a lot because I want to moat to you. It's like an emoji. I'm, I push that onto a helmet 
And so, it, which takes a lot of work because one little thing out, you you, you yeah. stuff it up, like you were saying with the yeah. line work, and you're like, oh, yeah, it's like that little. And, and and that's and that's the real trick is mm. is to not show your hand with that mm. stuff. I mean the the whole thing about Iron Man suits is that you know you you can make a mechanical suit and it can be you know it can be a space suit or it can be whatever else but but you know an iron man suit can't just be a suit that anybody can wear it becomes a character in itself mm. right so you have to you have to incorporate all of these um cues to heroic figures mm. without tipping your hand right like you, you you can't go as far as you know the Joel Schumacher Batman where you're putting nipples on it. Like <laughs> why would there be nipples on the thing, right? That makes it such a fetish thing. Yeah. But instead, <laughs> you're you're trying to you're trying to imitate musculature in the language of aerospace and automotive mm. in ways that people understand, right? Like like you do um, serratus muscles as air intakes with 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 veins or, uh, you know, like mm. not, not veins and blood veins, but, but, you know, mm. uh, air, airflow veins, um, you know, you do your scapula as flaps, you do, you know, you, you find these, these cues that you can put together so that mm. you're hiding the fact that you're actually tr trying to, uh, caricaturize a heroic human form, mm. but, but in, in technological language yeah right so yeah. so you're not you're not tipping your hand you know when you put in facial features and you try to create expressions and stuff you have to do it with with pieces that immediately people recognize as functional mm. so that they don't realize that what you're really doing is manipulating them emotionally yes so, yes <laughs> such a very careful dance that you have yeah. to play right it is and it takes time that you know when you're saying you refine and you polish these things like it takes time and the funny thing is in the in the cg world we have this thing of like i've just spent no time on this whatsoever and it is what it is like it's kind of like i if not like they kind of like I, if the quicker you can do something the better you are but i'm looking at a lot of quick work and it's not it's not really better because there's a process of understanding and emotional evaluation that you have to go through and that takes time like you can't just rush into it it doesn't happen it doesn't like the evolution like a lot of your stuff i would imagine with my stuff it evolves and it grows like an organic thing into becoming more hard surface like so you start off mushy and you're like it's like clay right and you're just feeling it out and then you feel it out and feel it out but it's I think we have this like I don't know it's like the instant gratification society that we live in and we expect things to be now done straight away so we we miss out on that emotional uh, investment in the work that we do and right. it's you know you look at a lot of stuff and it's like it's technical but it's not emotional and I I'm like I'm missing that because I, I I know uh, it's going to date me uh, like 10 years ago we used to have more emotional I would find a little bit more emotional work, but now we have that, like almost it's a little bit of an instant gratification that we look towards is like, Hey, I'm going to post this work, get likes, people will like it. And then the, the quicker I can continue to do that, but it's like the, the emotional investment in the art piece is, isn't, isn't there. Like it would be because I think when the whole, um, it's like, how many followers do you have? How many like likes can you get? I think we, we started yeah, gearing our mindset to it. I, yeah drives you nuts I, too well i just it's it's very hard for me to invest in the social media mm. piece i mean I've, I've gone for years and years without posting a single thing online mm. i mean yeah i didn't have a i didn't have an up-to-date website for probably a decade mm. you know my old saunderscreative.com website didn't have any of my movie work on it oh, well yeah. into a decade of movie work yeah because i just didn't have the time to invest in it and you know, it's, I, I guess, you know, people get their, people get their gratification in different ways. Mm. Um, and, you know, it's, it's always satisfying 
for me to to uh, you know get the the affirmation of my peers and and people that I respect. Um, you know that's that's huge for sure. Um, but the the social media piece is is a challenge and it used to be different. I mean, you know, there used to be a forum called Sijin that a lot of us started on okay. back in, you know, back in the nineties mm. and, and, you know, it was a lot of professionals going on there and critiquing each other's work. Mm. Um, and that was very useful. Um, and now you post something and there won't be a single critique. It'll all be, yeah. Yeah. Cool, that's awesome. That's great. And it's, you know, it's, it's nice, but it's kind of mind numbing. It doesn't, it doesn't mm. really give you anything as, as an artist. And I, I think, you know, the longer you work as an artist, the further you are from being satisfied with yourself. Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like mm. it's that, that vicious cycle of the more, you know, and the more you grow and the more you learn, the more you realize that you don't know and the more you realize that you're not yeah. capable of, you know, you, you become yeah. more educated and and so you're you're never really satisfied and you're always mm. looking for uh there's 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 like a visceral need for improvement, mm. right? And not affirmation because because you look at it and you go, yeah thank you yeah it's good but it's not awesome and great and amazing and, and you know it's <laughs> yeah i you know and especially when you're posting stuff mm. as a professional because you're posting stuff that's at least two or three years old because the mm. stuff you're working on now you won't legally be able to show for another three years unless unless you have a lot of time to do personal work which mm. i don't mm. um uh and so so all of that gratification that you get from from social media to, to me at least feels very hollow mm. because um while it's while it's always nice to be praised it it doesn't reflect my emotional perspective on my work mm. because i'm i'm looking at the next step you know, I'm looking at where I want to be, not where I am right now, and certainly not where I was three years ago. Mm. Um, so I, I don't find that feedback loop as I don't crave that feedback loop. Let's put it that way. Yeah. So, you know, I'll, I'll have a little stretch of like, okay, a movie comes out and I can, you know, trickle out a few pieces and it's great to have people go, oh, wow, and cool and stuff like that. And then I just won't post anything for a long time because I just I I don't have the energy to put into it. Yeah. And I know that's that's a little bit of in the modern age that's that's not serving the career because there's a lot of a, a lot of um, the younger generation that is moving into managerial positions you know, that is tangible. You know, mm. how many likes you have, how many followers you have is actually tangible and can be monetized as far as they're concerned, mm. right? So your yeah. value is tied to your branding and your branding is tied to how many followers you have mm. and things like that. I mean, it's, yeah. it's very... I, I mean, I think at one point you could probably do personal work and it would sell enough to the point that you could make enough money to live off it and sustain it because i think a lot of artists are doing that now yeah yeah, yeah. i think so you know I things think, like yeah. i mean i haven't i haven't uh tried patreon or anything like mm. that i don't know how mm. all those things monetize well, and... pa patreon is, is it's like a side thing but i think in terms of say if you were to sell prints or um actual paintings or like uh, canvas paintings that you can sell like or like you you as a branding because you have a like a everyone has their style behind them and you can even um like you can even teach because what you know i think is way more valuable than pretty much everyone else i've talked to in a long time just to be honest because you've come from 
a industrial background and you're the way you're speaking about design has been really refreshing to me and it's not be offensive to anyone else but it's just you your knowledge is reflected in your designs and you you talk in such a way where you actually know what you're talking about and this is this is where i've learned to start teaching and my thing is like i never knew what i was doing i just did it because i like right. but you you have so you have the explanation like you've unlocked even me talking to you i'm like oh that's what i do and so like yeah. i'm a little Enjoy. bit like clueless in the sense that like even i like um for me teaching i've started to learn like i someone said to me like you do this and do that and i'm like do i do that like so like i don't know sure. that i'm doing it but i have an understanding but you you have an extra understanding because you've had to go and so when you when you when you work on like you work on one thing for so long you know when when you work on so many different pieces of artwork but if you work on one piece of artwork where you've done that with cars you really have to digest what you are doing and really look at the minutia and the, the thing of what makes something work and you i find you can't do it with lots of designs but when you sit down and you go i have to break down every little bit of line work because every line work can make or break something if mm -hmm. you're being super nitpicky because it's true you can be really nitpicky and but that level of nitpickiness is maybe not reserved for um uh, work that is for um you know doing it doing it for jobs right that nitpickiness but the car industry is so you've sure. had to learn that nitpicky and you slowly interject that into the movies and you find i think maybe ha perhaps you find quicker ways to um, put that in because you so when you sit down and you do an iron man suit you know what will break it and what will make it quicker mm -hmm. and quicker and quicker and well, yeah and one of the reasons why i have uh stayed working with marvel for so long and, and work with them so frequently is the marvel visual development um is is such a unique entity as compared to the typical art department in the feature film business i mean you know with most movies you know they start an art department they hire a production designer a production designer gets a a supervising art director and they hire a bunch of artists and they put an art department together and and you're off to the races and you've got mm. this long list of things you got to design and it's very much now as opposed to 10 or 15 years ago it's about the volume that you have to produce in a short amount of time mm. and and it becomes a little bit like a machine mm. and and uh whereas visual development which is unique really in the industry to marvel you know it's it's one team um one core team of people uh and then freelancers like me who are frequent contributors who come back you know I, I still work at other studios and work on other kinds of movies but we come back and we've got a shorthand and because marvel places so much importance on the things that visual development handles which is basically um the, the k's the <laughs> characters creatures costumes and keyframes mm. so <laughs> um uh there's a degree of latitude that we're granted and an, a degree of time that we're given to to work on these things and refine them and refine them and not just not just refine the design which we absolutely do and put a lot of thought into them and a lot of story thought uh, but also because it's Marvel and it's a company that was built on artwork mm. where artwork is central rather than secondary, um, a lot of time given to producing beautiful artwork, mm. um, you know, like, like most of us do not photo bash the character likeness and we will, we will paint the likeness, mm. we will paint the face. Right. Yeah. And, and you know, we'll spend a day, you know, 
just doing the likeness and getting, you know, 25 photos of the inter off the internet of this character mm. because, you know, you can't find just the right photograph with the right lighting and the right angle and the right facial expression for the image that you're trying to portray. So mm. you've got to, you know, you got to make that up with mm. a lot of reference and understand that facial structure and, and how to light it and, and, you know, how to, you know, what happens between, you know, this expression and this expression, like <laughs> why is this one more intense and which facial muscles are moving? Cause you know, yeah, you go onto the internet and, and that actor will not have pictures of himself up there. They're always, you know, yeah. You know, the, <laughs> yeah. the marketing photos up on the internet, but not like that crazy expression that you need for this one emotional moment that you're doing in a keyframe mm. or, you know, when you're, when you're trying to present, you know, a costume design and you're not just presenting the costume, but you're presenting the character and the character emotion and the attitude. And, you know, that's, what's going to sell it, mm. um, is, you know, so it's, you can't just do a generic T pose kind of thing, right? You gotta, yeah. you gotta really put it in the moment so that they can see that character in the movie. Mm. Yeah. Uh, You've, you've actually got to do some acting yeah. uh, in that. Which takes and longer, right? It takes longer. Which takes longer. I mean, yeah. it takes a lot longer. I yeah, mean, it you does. know, it'll take you five seconds to find a photograph of someone on the internet and stick it on, on your image. But, you know, you'll spend a day painting that mm -hmm. face. I mean, it's, but, but you wouldn't necessarily get that from an art department. Mm -hmm. You just wouldn't that kind of flexibility and you get that at visual development because that's what's important to the producers mm. right um and and finding those story moments in keyframes and stuff mm. like that and that's that's very exciting to me and and the fact that you know we are encouraged to go in and paint that stuff and make mm. it look like a beautiful painting i mean you know it's that's a lot of Ryan, who, you know, I've worked with since before Iron Man one and who's, you know, just a genius. I mean, mm. you know, a, a once in a generation genius, as far as I'm concerned, um, in terms of just his ability to generate anything, frankly, I mean, I've seen him do, do hard surface creatures, costumes, mm. name it, and incredible portraiture and, and, you know, keyframes that he did in black and white for the first captain america mm. that look like you know line decker or uh or norman rockwell paintings yeah. you know with every single character having it <laughs> you know it just amazing like that kind of stuff is very mm. inspiring from a storytelling standpoint because you know that's that's the kind of challenge that i'm excited about tackling um because i find myself less emotionally invested in in the tech design aspect of what mm. i do as i am in the storytelling aspect mm. um like i write on the side that's kind of what i do with my free time um but you know like i can make myself cry writing a scene but i can't make myself cry like designing a car you know yeah. it's it's such a an intellectual exercise mm. as opposed to an emotional exercise and being able to bring that emotion into the painting and into the, into the, the design process mm. uh, is, you know, coming from the background that I do, which is, you know, how do I make a shiny box? <laughs> you know, it's yeah. a real challenge. I mean, people with my skill set and background do not necessarily do very good portraiture. I mean, you know what I mean? Like it's, well, I mean, they say artists are emotional. I mean, you could be boxing yourself up just saying that. So I yeah, don't know. I, yeah. you know, I, I've never thought of myself as an artist. I've always thought of myself as a designer and I still mm. think of myself as a designer. Right. Really? It's like, I don't know. It's well, I, I guess maybe you don't put any label on it. Like I, on art station, I took my label off. I didn't have any label on Facebook. I don't have no label. Cause I'm like, I don't want to label myself. Cause then I corner myself. So like you could be a writer. You just say I'm a writer. Like, you know how they say, like, if you say things to yourself, um, 
you kind of materialize your goals sure. a little bit. So like, my wife is a huge believer in that. Yeah. So this is something I've, that's why I, I, I'm like, well, I'm not a, like, am I, like, cause I question like, am I a designer or am I a, like this or that character? Cause I came from a character artist background. So am I a character artist? I do characters as well, but am I like, do I want to do industrial design now? Like, so with me, I'm just like, I'm nothing. <laughs> so. <laughs> I'll, it's a good yeah, approach. It's yeah. A good approach. I, think, I mean, yeah. I, I generally think of myself as a problem solver. That's yeah. That's how I characterize myself. That anything I do, I approach from a problem solving mm. solving standpoint. Right? Yeah. Whether it's a mechanical problem, whether it's a story problem, whether it's a character problem, mm. whether it's you know, it's like how do I get from here to there? How yeah. do I how do I serve this this goal? Right? Mm. Because it's I, I find myself, I'm not the kind of designer who is very good at, at just randomly blue sky generating something out of nothing. Mm. I feel like I respond best to a problem, right? Mm. Like give me a problem to solve and I will come up with a design solution that solves that problem and hopefully in the process i will discover something unique and interesting mm. but unlike you know some of my friends like like uh like scott robertson for example who is constantly looking for new processes and new techniques to find new form and new mm. new uh aesthetics for their own sake for me, it's always been, you know, in pursuit of solving a problem. Mm. And that's, and that's what drives my process. Have, have you tried, um, what I've been trying lately is drawing with my left hand because I wanted uh -huh. to break the rigidity of this because I find I draw yeah. differently. And so I'm like, oh, absolutely. yeah, I, I've been drawing like creatures and stuff with my left hand. And even even sci-fi and mechanical stuff and it's more organic in a weird way where this is so i find my it's the right hand of control memory. yeah it's muscle memory right yeah. you, you're you're used to starting a line like this or whatever yeah. i mean whatever your natural mm. inclination is it, it it does constrain you yeah you could try that if you because I, I always thought i wasn't very because you're saying you need a problem so when I sit down with my left hand, I have nothing in my head because I uh -huh. have a, like, I'm just like, eh, and then I'll, then I'll slowly attach what it is, a meaning behind it, a feeling slowly attach, but I'll let the, it grow organically with the learning of this hand. And so like, I, I kind of don't want to get good with my left hand because it's like, the, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like you where I go as your secret weapon. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, the same thing like in ZBrush, I'm not sure if, um, use the tablet and do you use the mouse in ZBrush at times uh, when you sculpt? No, I've always used, I've always used the tablet. So I mean, I'm using a teak now, but yeah, like, so sometimes, um, when I start like concepting and things, I'll use the, the mouse uh -huh. because it's a different, it's different control. It's more rigid. Right. And so I'm trying to get the loose control of the, the Cintiq and I can't get it. So I get a, a different, uh, answer to my, like my intentions and it's like i'm trying to constantly trick myself into getting a new beat uh, a new style something that i wouldn't come up with so yeah, yeah like it's because we're always that habit we we form habits very quickly and we can sure. then then do the same thing again and again and then i try and like then i'll start using the, the stylus to to go to go at it do you have you done any tricks to kind of like when you generate your ideas for like shape and form, you, you've got story behind it. But mm -hmm. generally when you sit down and you're sketching, what's the process for you? Like, are you, do you have references or are you at, at this stage, do you use references or anything I don't like use that? References at the beginning, generally yeah. speaking. Um, I tend to, well, I mean, if I, if I just use like suit design or costume design as example, mm. I, I always start from the pose and the mood and the attitude, right? So I will, I will just block out a figure 
mm. right? And I'll, and I'll and I'll come up with an idea for the lighting, and I'll and I'll create basically a a formless mannequin blob, mm. right? Mm. And then I start trying to shape that formless mannequin blob, mm. and I'll just I'll just explore on another layer with lines and stuff. I mean, uh, you know, on occasion I've I've taken photographs and 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 layered photographs with different blending modes to see if I can, you know, find some interesting shape intersection or something like that. Not mm. in a, in a very abstract way, not in a not in a literal way. Mm. Um, and just see if something emerges from it, uh, and that's that's occasionally successful. But I don't really rely on it because I mean that's I find that's usually good when I don't have a specific problem to solve, right? Mm. Um, uh, and it's it's not necessarily reliable. I mean, it's more if if I'm if I'm just aiming to do something interesting and I don't know what it is yet. But if I if if it's an actual design problem, it's it's harder because then it's like. I know I'm trying to design a certain, solve a certain design problem. Mm. Um, uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll just start exploring breakups and I'll start exploring edges and forms and ways things catch light and, and, you know, um, it's, it's, th this is actually where my transition to just sort of painting on one layer with, with one brush has sort of freed me up because mm. you know the the working in multiple layers with a very technical control kind of thing uh is the antithesis of that it, it doesn't really allow you to to find the thing emerging out of the blur um, yeah. one of the things that like like when i started out i started out you know doing a very tight line drawing. Like when I was a kid and in college and stuff, it was all about doing a very tight line drawing and rapidograph marker. And then I'd have this perfect line art and then I'd be terrified about painting mm. because I was going to ruin this, you know? And what broke me of that was taking plein air landscaping or plein air landscape painting classes in gouache and the class was like, okay, have just a little watercolor paper sketchbook, a limited little palette of gouache paints, and we're going to start with, okay, little tiny rectangles about this big. We're going to capture this image using just black and white, and you've got 15 seconds. Mm. And it was like, what? Yeah. And it's literally all you can do is put down a blob of black and a blob of white in 15 seconds, and that's yeah. it. Yeah. And the goal was to do that blob of white and and blob of black to the point where if you squint at it, yeah. you start seeing that image emerging. And yeah. then next, next time it's like, okay, now you've got grayscale and you've got 30 seconds to do it. And mm. then it's, we're going to give you a three color palette and you've got five minutes. And, and what it taught me is that you have to try and capture the image from the beginning, right? Mm. Start by capturing the image in as, as crude raw form as you can. And then whatever time you have in addition to that is, is a process of focusing it in, mm. right? So no matter at any point that someone says, okay, pencils down, the image is there. Mm. And the longer you spend, the more you're just refining it and refining it and refining it and refining it. Mm. And because I used to have like ter terrible blank page syndrome and terrible anxiety about painting and mm. you know 75 percent of my process was just pure emotional hell because it's like <laughs> this sucks this isn't good i don't know what it is blah yeah. blah blah and then finally 75 percent of the way through the process it would start taking shape and then the last 25 percent was oh this is great and i'm just detailing out or whatever yeah. and with this process the image emerges in the first 25% of the process. It emerges very quickly. Mm. And then you're just, like I said, you know, racking focus until it just comes into focus. Yeah. And you're not work, you're not worried about having these perfect edges or perfect lines or anything. You're you're just creating this blurry shape that blends into the background, and then you're, mm. you know, it's getting sharper and sharper, and then you're refining your edges and refining your yeah. detail stuff. And that's 
it was not just a better working process, but it was better emotionally and better mm. you know, psychologically. Mm. And so that's kind of how I approach things now that the less, the next, the less technical I can get, especially at the beginning, the better for me, the more mm. I can just do it with one layer for my background and one layer for my subject and just find it. Yeah. And then if I need to, you know, and then I get technical later on when I'm, you know, layering in textures for cloth, for cloth or layering mm. in other things or doing other, you know, yeah. So you, I, I get super technical in Photoshop because I've been using it since before there were layers when you had to do everything with channels, right? So, oh, you had to do things with channels, really? Oh, yeah, yeah. Pre Photoshop two point five. Wow. Um, yeah, everything was channels, and oh. and there were all kinds of like there were crazy techniques that you could do with channels yeah. to do an emboss effect and stuff like that. Yeah, I didn't think of that. There is because once you put a channel, it changes the because a different rgb channel like is this well these were yeah. these were these weren't rgb channels these oh. were i mean you know like when you go into your channels folder mm. in photoshop or the yeah. channels menu and it's basically your selection areas right yeah you could do a lot of the things that you can do with um with layer effects and with layers by creating channels right just mm. to isolate elements of your image so mm. You know, you could do an emboss, like if you started with just a square and you selected that square and then blurred it and then um, subtracted one channel from another, you could create the selection area to get the highlight on the top and then the selection area to get the highlight on the bottom yeah. and, and then paint into those to create the emboss effect that you would yeah. get from layer effects. And, you know, yeah. when, when you learn that kind of, um, technical mm. uh uh you know under the hood kind of uh approach to photoshop you know you you learn a lot of tricks that's, that's a pretty cool trick actually but it wouldn't be it's not needed now because you get layer now, yeah. but, but understanding how that stuff works mm. uh, helps you to solve a lot of problems in photoshop because photoshop mm. is a lot of problem solving too like you know how do i how do I get this particular effect or how do I get this particular texture or, you know, mm. things like that. Yeah. So, but I, but I try to keep all of that to the very end of my process now mm. because it gets in the way of my creativity and yeah, it stifles it. it so you, you pretty much you're drawing everything, right? You're not, there's no, not much photo manipulation, um, photo bashing, on top of your processes happening is that it's like uh not much i mean the i mean and that's that's been that's been a pretty controversial mm. uh, subject in development i mean just in at, at marvel viz dev we don't do a lot of photo bashing oh, uh, tell, i think you can tell with all the marvel stuff like when yeah you, i mean if you look at a, at a marvel yeah. art Marvel book. I mean, you can usually mm. tell what's art department and what's visual development just because mm. the visual development stuff all looks painterly and the mm. art department stuff all looks photo bashed and, mm. and, uh, and, you know, I have, I mean, it's, I think, I think photo manipulation is an important tool mm. for concept design. Mm. Um, I, find it to be a dangerous tool as well mm. yeah um, because for the same reason that 3d was a dangerous tool at a time as well like when i was in the video game world in the 90s and i was a creative director and i was hiring artists and you know it's 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 very easy for someone to with no artistic background to pick up a 3d package and within an hour they've got you know a beautiful photorealistic chrome cube and they're like i'm an artist, I'm an artist. yeah like with, without the understanding of everything that went into that behind the scenes mm. and you know it's it's the challenge that i always face of 
it's it's not what you don't know that kills you it's what you don't know that you don't know yeah right like yeah. then i can't explain it to you and i've and i've as an art director i've had that challenge a lot where you're trying to explain to someone why something is wrong mm. and but it looks good to me and 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 there's a disconnect because they haven't gone through the process of learning how to do all of this stuff by hand and so they mm. don't understand the mechanics underneath it yeah right they, they just understand how to manipulate it and mm. and so there's a lot of sort of fundamental aspects of what takes something from this level to this level that are completely missing and they don't that they don't even aren't even aware that they're missing yeah and then comes this you know well why is your opinion any better than mine <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> right yeah and and that's a challenge and and i think you know in this generation of artists uh photo bashing and photo manipulation is the same kind of thing because mm you can create an image very quickly just by grabbing a bunch of other images and manipulating them mm. and you know creating a new image and that's a very very powerful tool and you know digital matte painting wouldn't exist without it nowadays yeah yeah, um, yeah. And in the hands of someone who is who is um armed with the fundamental and is um you know, a, a talented and accomplished artist in their own right and theoretically could create that same image given a month mm. <laughs> of doing it by hand with really good reference. Mm. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful tool. The, the challenge is when it's in the hands of someone who doesn't have the fundamentals. Which is, uh, I think, a lot of people don't have fundamentals. A yeah. lot of, a lot yeah. of people mm. who, who, never drew anything by hand, never painted mm. anything by hand, started in digital, um, didn't get any training. Mm. Uh, and and not to say that there aren't tons of talented people who have started digitally and not had any formal training who aren't fantastic instinctive artists mm. and and who have, you know, studied on their own and pursued things on their own and and worked hard to develop those skills but but there's there's a, a degree of churn out there where it's like i'm just putting things together and creating images mm. that where i guess i guess fundamentally what i think the danger is in that process of starting from photo material is that it's taking choices away from you right yeah. mm -hmm. choices of pov choices of color palette choices of of mood and atmosphere choices of um perspective choices of of form choices of all of these choices are already defined by what's in the image mm -hmm. so you're it's it's like working with your hands tied right mm. you're not you're not driving the image what you can find is driving the image mm. right and and it has its place absolutely in in searching for something new mm. right? but when you are working towards a vision of your own and starting from the standpoint of your vision and then trying to achieve that vision, it's extremely limiting. Yeah. It's not really design. And when you're, yeah. and not just in terms of image making, but when you talk about, um, you know, it's so easy for someone to, you know, rough out a black silhouette and then get a bunch of photos of machine parts and motorcycle pieces and whatever and start mm. layering there and then you get this accretion of GAC yeah that has a has a you know unique silhouette and voila that's design and yeah. it's I, there's I, no yeah well I think what's happening is that we have a simple thing is if it looks realistic right we think it's believable so right. then we see the lighting it's real lighting right so we're like oh it's real 
And then we have that extra layer of believability and we believe it. Dumb monkey mind sees it. That right. looks cool. Um, I believe it's real because it's real, literally. But like you were saying, it's a bunch of just stuff can be chucked in order. And I think, I think it, we've, we had like in the art community, I think we've had that. I, I always say, I hope it's true. There's always room for good artists. You know what I mean? Like, like artists who actually, um, where that can somewhat cheapen what artists do where say that you're, you sit down and you're, you're, you're still putting in the, the work and the, the de uh, visual development on your part with the raw methods that you're using, because you know, developing, it's like if you kit, look, let's say if you photo bash Iron Man together, all right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. It would look shit. All right. It would. <laughs> so, okay. Cause that's a perfect example. And that's, that's what's happening now. We are photo bashing designs for the sake of like i don't think you would have to take too much extra time to sit down and draw something because you would have to essentially when you photo bash something someone still has to remake that thing like build it out of sure. all that stuff so like i think you get lag time but it looks faster here but the lag time is still here and i think you, you start you start making up time along the line because like if you then take the photo manipulated thing and you go, oh, okay, we'll put this in 3D. It just doesn't work. It looks like crap, right? And so you have right. to tune it here. And then the thing is when you've, you know, like if you spray, if you, if you ever spray painted a car, you put prep work into the primer. And if you don't prime it and get it smooth, yeah. you've stuffed up the paint job. Well, that's, that's the old yeah. joke used to tell in uh, <laughs> in the automotive industry is like, yeah. oh, we'll just fix it in the clear coat. <laughs> everything shows and i think that's i think that's what's happening now so like when when i um see when i worked on uh, some projects i would make sure that i didn't want to be chucking parts in like from a kit bash per se i would want to do little bits of it later down the line once i've got the forms there right and they read but i think people are starting with the kit bash and then you yeah. end up with a bashed well, up that's design. That's the important distinction. I mean, mm. for me, there's a difference between photo bashing and photo texturing. Yeah. Right. And and what I do is photo texturing because I create the image myself first. Mm. Right. I mean, even if I'm going to do something in 3D, I will do a rough painting of it first and then start doing. You know, and it's like you know, if if I've got like a row of ten things mm. going into distance and they're complex things i'm like i am totally going to do this in 3d because it's going to take me forever to paint those things yeah. over and over again right yeah. so i know i'm going to do 3d if i'm going to do anything architectural i'm going to do a block model in 3d mm. to start with because you know i know i can do it in perspective i've done it in perspective but it's painstaking and yeah. tiring and and there's no value to it if i mm. can actually set up a 3d scene and paint over it yeah. Um, um, and you know, but but the point is to to do something where you are controlling all of the aspects. Well, not so much that you're controlling, but you're making you're making a conscious decision mm. about everything that goes into it. You're not just leaving it up to your found objects, right? Yeah letting those make the decision for you you're making a conscious decision about where you're placing the camera how you're going to light it mm. what the shapes are going to be what the composition is going to be you know why a design is a certain way etc mm. um and then somewhere along the process you know i think you know photo texturing is is a great innovation for introducing believability and mm. realism and granularity to something that otherwise would take you forever yeah. to to paint and 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 also if you're doing it all by hand you know there's uh you know a good analogy is uh you know one of my first movies was zathura which was like a 
you know, sort of sequel to Jumanji about a bunch of kids who play a game and their house ends up flying in space. Oh, yeah, I remember that one. Yeah. Yeah. And, and John Farrow was super smart in saying he didn't want the robot in that thing to be all CG. He wanted a guy in a suit. And what he wanted was partial suit and certain pieces to be green screen, right? And what was brilliant about that is you have this actual guy with, you know, the top half of the suit and the boots, the shoes or whatever mm. are practical. And then the legs, which are going to turn into spindly little robot legs, um, green screen. But you have this actual guy interacting with the environment. And, you know, it was kind of clumsy. And so there's scenes where he, he goes around the kitchen, around the island in the kitchen, and he slips and bangs into something. And that was not planned. And yeah. for an artist to think about that and come up with that and come up with these tiny little granular nuances that are happy accidents when you do something for real, mm. it's very challenging. And the world in which we live now where there's this mentality that everything has to be generated in the box rather than in the real world, in the, in the visual effects world, has kind of sterilized things in a way mm. where if you actually went out into the real, you know, I've, I've had some discussions with some old matte painter friends of mine who, you know, started with glass painting. Yeah, that's a, and, that's a, that's a skill, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. no, seriously. And yeah. And, you know, their approach to matte painting is, you know, okay, if I'm going to do a matte painting and I want it to be really realistic, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, like I got this friend Rocco Geoffrey who, you know, worked on Blade Runner and things oh, like cool. that. Yeah. And he's transitioned into digital matte painting, mm. but, but what he'll do, like, you know, he'll, He'll have a friend build him a model, like a practical model. Yeah. He'll take it out into the sunshine, shoot photos of the model in the sunshine, yeah. and then bring those in and paint over those and incorporate them into a scene because there's there's little granular nuances of reality that you just can't get out of the box, yeah. right? And when he's taking it to the next step and compositing in smoke, it's like, well, you know, I could sit here and I could go to a particle effects thing and I could try to get the particle effects smoke to do blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And instead it's like, fucking, why don't you go out into the backyard, <laughs> set a fire, shoot it against the blue sky and composite it in. And it's yeah. going to be so much more realistic. And, yeah. you know, and we forget about these things. Yeah, we do. And that is a place where I think photo texturing can help because if you're mm. making it all up, you're going to make up this idealized picture in your mind mm. of something mm. rather than, you know, or it's going to be, you know, your trees are going to be the repeated leaf brush or, you know, unless yeah. you're very impressionistic, which I prefer where it's just like brush strokes that suggest yeah. the tree or whatever. But, but if you need to do something with a, a high level of realism, then yeah, start mm. compositing in, but, but composite them in, in such a way that you're not, changing the vision mm. you're not you're not compromising to what you can find on google mm. yeah. you know what i mean yeah. you're still making conscious decisions about you know it's it's an additional layer of something mm. that doesn't take away from the intent mm. you're doing like very much steps in it's like a, a procedure type of thing an understanding and i think it's it's you know how people talk about fundamentals at one point that you know how people would be um they would never draw anything and they go straight into 3d but a lot of times um if you're going straight into a, a thing where it's already established photo manipulation you, you're kind of you're skipping a whole bunch of like steps to get to a drawing like so what you find now that I see people doing with photo manipulation is drawing, and then they put photos on top, which mm -hmm. is a little bit more applicable in in that way because at least you're building the fundamentals. And so what you're doing is you're purely texturing, and that 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 is like essentially more organic, and that's how you can see. So you, it's like when you do um, if you. If you do like a character or something like that and you need some pause it'd be insane 
to go and do the pause by hand, but it's so what you're doing is like your understanding is that at the bare minimum you want well you want to do these things because you know that you've done it and look have you tried photo bashing things oh have yeah you, and you're not sure, happy with I, it i find the process incredibly frustrating oh really i, I yeah i i the, the problem is is that i have i have a very specific vision for for how i want things to look mm. and i could spend more time than it would take me to paint the thing just searching for exactly the thing that would fit okay yeah you know plug in like a puzzle piece to what i'm envisioning right yeah just going through page after page after page of google images yeah or just taking that thing and then warping it into exactly the correct perspective because mm. things that are out of perspective drive me insane like i can see them <laughs> immediately when they're out of perspective yeah you know when they're you know when i've got something that's supposed to be a long lens and and something's foreshortened with a wide angle lens mm. and you know and i have to because i do that i mean you know if i'm doing a big scene and i've got to populate it with you know burnt out cars and people and stuff like that mm. sure i'll grab I'll grab photos of stuff and I'll drop them in and then I'll manipulate them and I'll paint over them. Cause at least it gives me something there. Mm. Right. Yeah. As, as detail. Cause, cause hand painting all that detail is going to take me forever. Oh, yeah. I, I, right. Yeah. You can't, yeah. I can't do it on a, on a professional timeline. Mm. Um, unless, unless you're going to do what used to be done, which is a very painterly impressionistic, Mm. gouache painting style type of thing mm. right which directors can't see anymore oh right what do you mean you can't um, see they don't accept they it just, if if it doesn't look like a finished frame of film they don't oh. get it oh really i literally had someone once tell me okay now just an executive though in a meeting mm. like now the the movie is it isn't in black and white though right the movie is going to be in color like <laughs> <laughs> right but but that's i mean that's the extreme of it wow but yeah jeez yeah the inability to fill in the blanks and interpret and you know you, yeah it's just some directors and some directors prefer to have something that isn't photorealistic because you give them a photorealistic image and they feel trapped and locked in and like mm. oh it's, it's finished and you're giving me something finished and i didn't have a chance to to have any input into it, right? Yeah. And they want to see looser, sketchier stuff. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, it's really interesting. But um, yeah. I don't know how long have we we've been going for a while. I'm sure we're both sure. getting tired. I, I I wanted to ask if um, when you get your workstation back, would you like to do like a demonstration of that? Um, just some some of some of the Iron Man type of uh, finishing and just little little bits. It's just very interesting the way you work. I would um. Imagine what people. do you mean by get my workstation back? Oh, because you're not at your workstation. I, like, because you're, no, yeah, am. you are. No, your, you yeah, are. No, I, I brought my whole kit here. Oh, okay. So okay. I'm oh, okay. Here All right. Well, I guess um, we could months, get, so. I could get you on and uh, we could sit down and just chat design. Would you want to do that? And just um, your visual understanding of how you maybe approach something and just because I, I think you, you're full of information that I think people would love to hear more about and be really cool to um get uh sure, yes yeah. um you don't have to do it anytime soon be but in a while yeah yeah don't 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 feel um it's when you get time it's when you when yeah. you feel up to it no well, pressure it's been an awesome conversation because yeah. I, I i just i'm so refreshed by hearing your um you know very thoughtful perspective on design which is clear in the stuff that you do that mm. that that you've thought about every single piece mm. um and uh you know it's 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 more rare than it should be and you know people people know the names of all the people who do it because they're yeah you know it's, it's funny eh? people like yourself and vitali mm. and, and ryan and, and mm. you know and uh you know james klein and and a lot of the people that i know who really do like agonize over <laughs> over you yeah. know, shapes and forms and you know 
these are the people who stand out because it's it's clear that there's something special about them that it's not mm. just you know the uh you know dip it in butter and roll it in model kit parts <laughs> I've never heard of that. <laughs> that's a really cool analogy to, yeah but um yeah i think we'll, we'll end on that note and uh yeah it's been great talking to you phil and uh yeah, it's been a great pleasure let's definitely yeah. keep in touch yeah yeah um definitely but uh yeah all right i'll uh i'll talk to you in uh in the future hopefully at some point and if you ever get any time just uh let me let me know and it'd be great to chat shop and things like that and even of if course. you even if you don't want to be um on video or anything on uh on online it would be great to talk to you or even you know in general because um you bet, anytime yeah, yeah. all right in, I'll, in, I'll... The, in the age of isolation what which you're not having to deal with yeah being in uh being in a place with actual leadership <laughs> Well, yeah, it's it's all controversial, um, controversial uh, stuff happening at the moment. It's pretty, yeah, yeah, it's pretty crazy in the US at the moment. But uh, yeah. yeah, making making online connections like this is is what we're left with since we yeah. can't be in an office full of our peers. Mm. So yeah, all right, all right, man. I'll uh, yeah, we'll touch base soon at some point. And uh, yeah, it's been great talking. It's been awesome talking. Actually, you too. really cool. All right, I'll uh, see you later. All right. See ya. See ya. See ya.